As a student, I remember being a little bit confused on when I should paralyze a patient and when an LMA was satisfactory. So something I want to start doing with this channel is going through cases I did this week and what that day looked like as far as the types of patients I saw and the types of procedures we did. Today I'm going to discuss my bronchoscopy cases I did a couple weeks ago. As a reminder, the type of anesthetic we choose for a case is dependent on two factors, the patient and the surgeon, and obviously the procedure type which kind of falls under the surgeon category. So here you can see the four cases I did in bronchoscopy lab. We did a bronch rigid or flex with wing needle biopsy, bronch rigid or flex with tracheal or bronchial dilation, bronch with bronchial alveolar lavage, and bronch airway inspection. As far as deciding what the anesthetic should be, I consider two factors, well, three. One, the patient. Is there any reflux? Do I have any fear of them aspirating? That's first and foremost. Two. What does the surgeon need? There are some cases that could be an LMA, but due to the surgeon, they're going to be in tube because you're just going to have a simpler, easier time. Uh, with bronchoscopy, we tend to use air cue LMAs if the surgeon allows or the patient allows or 8.0 ET tubes. The bigger ET tubes are used for them to be able to pass their instruments and do whatever it is that they need to do in those lungs. Each institution tends to have their own unspoken rules for the neurocytes and the ORs and what they expect of anesthesia. These are simply our unspoken rules as far as the air cue goes, the 80 ET tube, your providers might have different expectations of you, so just make sure to clarify. So you can see I listed out some important takeaways from the patient's H&P, uh, ones that would be of most concern to me when I'm pre oping them. The first patient had several autoimmune disorders, so with that, I considered uh, the use of steroids and uh, avoiding steroids. Second patient had chronic kidney disease, so with them, I didn't want to use any long-acting agents because Bronclab tends to have pretty quick procedures, and with end-stage renal disease patients, you cannot determine, you cannot predict how quickly they're going to metabolize certain longer-acting agents or medications such as Versed. So I want to stick to quicker metabolized medications like fentanyl and avoid Versed and Dilaudid. Again, that is my practice. Other people do it differently. To this patient, I gave Presidex and I gave fentanyl. And I'll go over more in depth here in a second. Third patient was a young female with cystic fibrosis. The most important thing when I discuss this with my student is um, I ask what are some things that you might want to give her, what are some considerations you might want to do, and we'll discuss that here shortly. But one thing my student said is that we might give robinol for secretions. This is not correct. And I just want to point this out because I can see how the misconception can be made. And no shame to my student. She did a wonderful job. We had a great day. Uh, but I just want to point that out because if you give Robinol, they're still going to have the secretions because that is the nature of their disease. All you're going to end up doing is thickening those secretions and making them more difficult for them and possibly complicate your situation. And the fourth patient, most notable thing about his HNP, he had a T-tube and he's had several procedures, but the most concerning thing for us was the 156 kilos. When you see a patient this morbidly obese in a quick procedure, you're worried about giving them too much and then struggling with their airway when they're done with this quick procedure. So that's something you wanna consider. So here you can see that we placed an LMA for all of our patients. We need to, to place larger sized LMAs for everyone if they can tolerate it. Um, so we placed a four and a half air cue in everyone. The first patient got two milligrams of Versed in pre-op. She got a standard induction, so lidocaine propofol, LMA was placed, and she had a propofol infusion. In our bronch labs, we tend to run propofol infusions because the airway is open half the time, so you constantly have uh, seal leaks, you have to run higher flows, so you have a chance of not providing adequate anesthesia if you use a volatile anesthetic because of these factors. So it's just safer to run propofol, first of all. And second of all, these procedures tend to be on the quicker side. So it's easier to turn off the propofol, uh, know that in five minutes they will run through five, ten minutes. They're going to run through all of the propofol, burn through all of the propofol, and you'll be fine. 
as opposed to volatile anesthetic, which is dependent upon their respirations and the adequacy of said respirations. So first case was completely unremarkable, except the patient had a several autoimmune disorders, which basically meant that we didn't really give any steroids. Second patient was the chronic kidney disease patient. So with him, we gave him Presidex in pre-op, 12 of Presidex, I believe. Standard induction, lidocaine propofol, placed the LMA, started the propofol infusion. Once they were done, we turned off the infusion, removed the LMA when we felt he was adequately ventilating, and took him to PACU. For the propofol infusions, I, for general anesthesia, I do not run my propofol infusions at less than 125 mics a kilo a minute. Uh, That is my personal preference. I want to provide assurance, at least to myself, that uh, the patient won't recall anything. Another tip that I found to be helpful for longer procedures, not so much these, is placing a biz monitor on the patient's to determine the depth of the anesthetic so I can start tapering down my propofol. Because when you first start out, you're going to start out at 175, 200. And once the patient gets saturated, you can start working this down. And I believe there is a Stanford article that I've quoted in previous videos that talks about the approach to weaning down your profile. I believe it was the interior posterior case that I did not too long ago. I know the biz monitor is controversial and a lot of providers hate it, but since it's a tool in our arsenal, I like to stick it on the patients, especially if I'm doing straight TIVAs, just to determine the depth of anesthesia. It's just another tool. I don't have to follow the numbers. So third patient is the one with the cystic fibrosis. So she had extreme anxiety. So she said before we could take her back, we had to give her four milligrams of Ursaid, 50 milligrams of Benadryl, and 100 of fentanyl and 20 Presidex. So that is what she received in the pre-op area and it did not face her. Once we got to her to the OR, I went ahead and hooked up her propofol infusion and did not start it. We got the monitors on, we started the propofol infusion and we just did blow by O2. Uh, so the mask was not on her face. It was just kind of beside her. Um, and she tolerated that pretty well. Then she dozed off. Once we gave her the induction drugs, lidocaine and propofol and we placed the LMA once they were done procedure, it was a very quick procedure. Once they were done, we removed that LMA, made sure her respirations were adequate, and then took her to the PACU just to prevent any kind of PTSD or any kind of psychiatric reaction to being in the OR and seeing all the equipment because she had very, very bad PTSD. So with the last patient is when things got interesting. So on this last patient, he was 153 kilos, I believe. Let's see, 156 kilos. And so we wanted to try the drug Bifavo on the cystic fibrosis patient, but she politely declined. She just wanted to go with the tried and true. And I understand because she had very bad PTSD. So on this patient, we decided to try Bifavo. I have not used Remy Mazalam in my practice. This was my first time using it. We had had an in-service maybe a year, a year and a half ago on how to use Remy Mazalam. And since then we hadn't really gotten to use it myself and my coworkers because our patient population didn't really meet the requirements. And I wanted to gauge the effectiveness of Remy Mazalam solely without any kind of adjuncts. So we gave two milligrams of Bifavo in pre-op. The patient, he was very familiar with anesthetics. He had multiple anesthetics. He knew Versed. He knew how drugs were supposed to make him feel. And he said that that was about how he felt with two of Versed. So we took him to the OR, we hook up all the monitors, I gave him an induction dose of five milligrams of Bifavo, and we just observed. He acted as you would expect someone to act once they received four or five milligrams of Versed. He was drowsy but arousable, his airway was not compromised. So I started working in two to three milligrams every minute or two to try to get him to an inductible state so we could place the LMA safely. I don't know if it's due to the potency of Bifavo or due to the, my patient's size, but after 10 milligrams of Bifavo over the course of eight minutes, he we were not able to place LMA. We didn't even try because whenever we said his name, he would open his eyes. So at that point, I gave 20 milligrams of propofol. We observed, again, arousable. Gave another 30 milligrams of propofol. I asked my 
student to perform a jaw thrust. The patient did not react to the jaw thrust. And that is when we slipped the LMA in with no complications. So for induction, we ended up giving 10 milligrams of bifavo and 50 milligrams total of propofol. If I were to adjust that induction, I would probably just give five or six of bifavo on induction and then give 20, 30 milligrams of propofol on induction and see where that takes you. So the procedure went great. His vital signs looked beautiful. His airway looked phenomenal on a support pressure of 10, which for someone this size laying supine is a miracle. One thing I will note is that I wanted to see how quickly that drug kind of started wearing off and his airway started to become reactive. And it was right around the five minute mark. So at that point, I worked in the rest of the bifavo, two milligrams at a time, bumps of propofol. And as a total, I believe we ended up giving 20 milligrams of bifavo, 200 milligrams of propofol once the procedure was done. And the procedure ended up being around 15 minutes. So that may have been overkill, but that was our first time using the drug. We may have been able to scrape by with less if we used it more correctly, but it was trial and error. So once they were done with the procedure, uh, we assessed his breathing. He was breathing great four or 500 tile volumes with the LMA in place on a support pressure of 10. We flipped him over to the bag to see what he was doing without support. Still grade two, 300 tidal volumes, no problems. So we removed the LMA to assess the tone of his airway. The tone of his airway was great. We did not have to place an oral or a nasal airway. He was moving air beautifully. Now we did sit him up once they were done to like 30, 45 degree angle. So that did help. But yeah, we took the LMA out, he flew, so we took him to PACU. 10 minutes after I dropped him off in PACU, we went back to check on him just to see how quickly the bifavo was wearing off, plus the profile. And within that 10 minutes, he was already awake. I asked him how he felt. He said fair. And he was discharged within the hour. My impression of bifavo. Although it is not the most efficient drug in terms of speed, the way you picture an induction looking, The fact that this large patient with a lot of comorbidities was discharged within an hour of being dropped off in PACU with no complications, we did not have to place any kind of airways in him besides the LMA for the procedure, is phenomenal. I would trial by Favo more in Bronx to figure out the correct dosage formula for certain patients, but overall my impression of by Favo is positive. I had a coworker the following week uh, used by Favo in Bronc Lab, and it did not go as planned. And funny enough, it was, it was the same student. And the patient they chose to try the Bifavo on had really bad anxiety, was probably more similar to our cystic fibrosis patient that required 4 milligrams of Versed, 100 of fentanyl, 50 of Benadryl, 20 of Presidex, and was unfazed. So they tried the Bifavo induction dose that I recommended with the adjunct of propofol no success. So they went full induction dose of propofol, 200 milligrams, started the IV infusion and bumped it with bifavo throughout the case. It was a quick case. And that was that. So the success rate on the bifavo right now is 50-50 as far as our institution's attempts by the anesthesia providers. I don't want to speak for the whole entire institution, just to my knowledge. I know the IV sedation nurses use bifavo pretty successfully in Bronc Lab, but as far as the anesthesia personnel, that was my first time using it and I asked around and it doesn't seem like anyone else had used it. So those are my impressions. Um, The quick summary of the Bronx cases, just to summarize, you can use an LMA or an ET tube for Bronx lab, either an AO ET tube or an air cue. And the reason we use air cues is because it's resealable. So like a standard LMA doesn't have the attachment that they like, whereas the air cue does larger sizes. Verify with the surgeon, see what anesthetic they need. We typically run IV propofol infusions for all of our bronch labs. The reason that I already described, because it reduces the chances of awareness during the procedure because you know you're providing an adequate anesthetic. So with that in mind, make sure your IV is not questionable. Our first patient had a questionable hand 22 gauge that, no, no, it was a 22 gauge in the AC that 
would infuse at 60 drops an hour. <laughs> so we had to start a new one and her veins blew. So it took like a couple of attempts. So make sure you have a good IV, propofol IV infusion. LMAs are good unless you're worried about the patient aspirating or the surgeon requests an ET tube, in which case you would size up to an ADO, regardless of whether it's a small female or a male, because that is what they need to perform their procedures and not delay the length of the surgery. For the propofol infusions, you can utilize a BIS monitor to help evaluate the depth of the anesthetic. Again, I use it more as a guide and I don't base my whole entire anesthetic upon the BIS monitor values because I've had a BIS monitor completely come off a patient and still read 30 to 40. So I take them with a grain of salt. Um, I try to use shorter acting agents such as Presidex and Fentanyl over Versed and Dilaudid. Again, if a healthy young individual came in for a bronchoscopy, I would give them Versed because I'm not really worried about it. But with chronic disease, especially renal disease or depending on the organ of metabolism of the particular drug, I would keep that in mind if the patient has a disease process of that organ. One quick tip, not specific to Bronch Lab, but just a general tip for LMA placements is that I personally like to hold off titrating fentanyl until after the patient has gotten back breathing. So what does that look like? I induce my patient with lidocaine and propofol. Once they're asleep, place the LMA, turn on my gas, get the patient back breathing and then work in my fentanyl once they're back breathing. Because you can limp by in a case with a not so great LMA, but spontaneous ventilation. But once you knock out that spontaneous ventilation, that LMA has to be seated really, really well. Another tip is that if I didn't give fentanyl, gave lidocaine, propofol, patient is asleep, place my LMA, turn on my gas, I initially set my ventilator to be on SIMV mode and control that pressure to be about 10 and roll down my trigger, my flow trigger to 0.8. That way they have to give the slightest bit of effort in order to trigger the PSV support. The reason I do that is to get gas on board. That way they don't wake up with an LMA in their mouth because that propofol is going to get metabolized and there's no volatile anesthetic on board because the, I'm waiting for them to spontaneously ventilate. So using SIMV to get some gas on board is my way of ensuring that they don't start to wake up and try to cough up that element. And that's about all I have to say about my Bronch Lab day. Uh, let me know what you guys found beneficial, what you wish I would have excluded, what you wish I would have included so I can make these videos better for you guys. But other than that, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please leave some feedback so I can keep improving this channel and I hope you have a wonderful day.